Good morning, our scholars. Welcome back to Asylum. Huh. Yeah, Michi. Couldn't have waited to the end of the video or started to be itchy before I started recording. Anyway, how are you guys doing? Again, like I said in the last video, sorry for some late uploads. I was playing this uh, tabletop called Masks with my friends last night. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I didn't get home until about 3.15. And I didn't fall asleep until about 3.36. And um, then I had to put Iggy in the tub. He's back now. Then I had to get something to eat. Then I had to get something to drink. And then I had to get something to drink after recording the last video. And I had to say hi to my mom because she's not taking her medicine like she's supposed to. And I hatched a Charmander. I hate everything. Anyway, we are on chapter 5, page 44. Dan was dusty and exhausted by the time he got back to his room, opening the door carefully so as to not wake Felix. He took a step in and was gripped by cold. This isn't my room, Dan blinked, disoriented. It looked like a cell of some sort, with floors and walls made of heavy gray stone. An operating table covered with a thin white sheet stood in the middle of the room. In the corner nearest him was a drain. Why? Dad could, Dan could only guess. A small window cut into the top of the far wall. Uh, a small, small window cut into the top of the far wall was covered by crisscrossing metal bars. But the most unnerving thing about the room was the pair of shackles that were bolted to the wall on the left. At first, Dan thought they were rusty, but not that he really looked at them. He could see that they were dark red stains. Uh, or that the dark red stains were far too wet to be rest. Why do I know this room? Dan quickly closed the door and started rubbing his arms with his hands and got rid of the chill. He tried to rationalize what had just happened. Had he opened the wrong door by mistake? That would explain it. He was extremely tired and just got, uh, just taken a wrong turn and ended up in the wrong room. A nightmare room he, that he had uh, that hadn't been used in decades. Yeah. Right. You can check the door number. 3808. That was his number. What was going on? After rubbing his eyes with his trembling hands, Dan opened the door again. And there was his room. Two desks, two chairs, two beds, with the sleeping bump of Felix on the nearer one. Dan stepped in and closed the door, leaning against it. He tried to catch his breath coughing from the dust still lodged in his nose and throat. His mind had wandered, that was all. It had wandered too far, but now he had it back. That is not a great sign. I mean, he could be crazy. I don't think that's it. Which, in and of itself, wouldn't be a good sign. Anyway, unsurprisingly, Dan couldn't sleep. Tossing and turning, he banished the photographs from his head, only to be overcome by the weird hallucination he just had. Intermittent snores from Felix didn't help. Around 2.30, he finally gave up trying. He grabbed his laptop from the desk and crawled back into bed with it. Maybe he could find out more about Brookline, something that might explain those horrid photographs. He typed in Brookline in history, and that brought up a list of various towns by Brookline, adding a new half hour. Turned up a vague summary of the senatorium's history, which contained nothing Dan didn't already know. That it had been, uh, or that it had housed the mentally ill, both men and women, and had been bought by the college after it closed. He decided to try an image search. Instantly, a results page full of vintage photographs of Brookline's exterior showed up in black and white. The building looked even more menacing. Narrowing the parameters further, Dan typed in Brookline and history and asylum, and there finally was a link. Uh, finally was a link that looked promising, judging by the garish purple background and abundance of animated GIFs on the page. It was a homemade website, to put it nicely. The title was what caught his interest, though. Brookline, curing the insane or creating them? Pretty sensationalistic, Dan thought, but it only went more over the top from there. The page was full of uh, was long and gave him off some serious conspiracy theory paranoia vibes. 
I am no stranger to these. If you've been on the channel long enough, I'm sure you realize. I saw letters to investigator, hobbyist, and oh boy, ghost hunter, I had painstakingly compiled what must have been every bit of news Crookline had ever made in local or national papers into one long text block. Statistics about how many patients had been at the asylum at its peak. Stories about how when it closed in 1972, patients had been, re uh, patients had been relocated to other hospitals or released repeatedly. Uh, uh, what? Oh, repeatedly, Dan came across references to the difficulties Brookline had had in keeping a warden. The turnover sounded worse at McDonald's or a cashier at Walmart. Finally, about three-fourths of the way through themselves one new uh, write-up, Dan found something uh, a line, a throwaway of maybe, but he read it to himself several times. It wasn't until 1960 that Brookline found the man who would redefine and refocus its entire purpose. And his name was, and what was the new purpose? But the article didn't say. It's called Narrative Focus, Sal. Look it up. Dan said aloud, but he remembered he had a roommate. Luckily, Felix seemed to be a deep sleeper. Dan scanned down the page. The reason behind Sal's uh, literary ADD became quickly obvious. Why fixate on garbage like the rate of warden employment compared to our serial killers to discuss? Uh -oh. By far the most controversial of Brookline's patients was the serial killer Dennis Heimlein, more commonly known as the Sculptor. Ooh. Between 1960 and 1965, he terrorized a small rural community in Vermont. Police estimate that he killed more than a dozen people, earning his name from the grisly way he left his victims posed like statues. One report described the cold, terrible beauty of a young woman found dancing in the wild of the White Mountains, her mutilated arms tied to tree limbs high above. The most horrifying crime he committed occurred at a local, local pub. The victims were posed in various places around, uh, throughout the bar, some standing, some sitting, and some engaged in a kind of revelry on the dance floor all held in place by ropes and wires. Perhaps more disturbing than the sculptor himself since the fact that uh, when Brookline closed, no trace of the sculptor could be found. Well, that's horrifying. Dan was riveted. A serial killer had been a patient here in this building. Where had they kept him? Probably in your room. If he's anything like me, that would be my luck. Where had they kept him? What kind of treatment had he received? Where had he gone? Dan closed up his laptop and lay back down on the bed. Just as he was drifting off, he remembered the photo of his troubled patient and wondered if that could have been Dennis Heimlein. Maybe his parents had been right to worry about him coming here. Having a speckled past like uh, was one thing, but a serial killer? Uh, treatment photos? Well, he wouldn't be sharing these discoveries with Paul and Sandy. That was for sure. Chapter 6 no offense, Dan, but you look like garbage. Did you have trouble sleeping or something? Abby's voice sounded like it was coming from the bottom of the pool. Realizing he'd begun to nod off, Dan roused himself enough to lift his head and shove a bite of cereal into his mouth. He wondered if the halo of fuzzy light that looked uh, somewhat calm around her head was from the morning sun through the skylight or from this almost total lack of sleep. He decided against telling Abby about what he found online because he was worried it would sound too weird and that it would make him sound too weird. He was only just getting to know her. He didn't want to blow in the first 24 hours. <laughs> Felix snores like he swallowed a frog or a lion. That bad? Yeah, and then he was up at the crap of dawn to go work out, of all things. Needless to say, I don't think I'll be getting much sleep this summer. You sure you're not just worn out from our little ordeal last night? She didn't beat him on the bush. He liked that. But you're gonna love me. Sorry, I just... It's not very often I get to quote the Dark Knight trilogy, so I take every chance I can. I guess it was pretty intense, he said. Uh, he had certainly seemed enamored of that one photo. They'd almost had a fight over it. Dan frowned. He couldn't even remember now why he'd been so adamant about her leaving it there. A stab of pain in his head made his eye twitch. I have those two. Dang it. 
I did not want to feel like this on the first full day. Having pushed a cup of coffee across the table. Try that. It's strong enough to cool a jet. Again, I gave up coffee. Ah, my book. He turned the cup, careful to avoid the smudge of pink he left on the rim. He took a sip and tasted something between lighter fluid and maple syrup and rushed to swallow before the sweet sludge could make its way back out. Wow! How do you drink that? I actually hate the taste of coffee, but the sugar helps cover it up, she admitted. And you can't be an artist and not drink coffee. It's just not done. Every installation I've ever gone to has either coffee or wine, so you have to suck it up and deal. Dan laughed. Abby didn't seem like she cared if uh, she fit in or not, but maybe everyone made a few concessions here and there. Just last year, he'd broken down and bought a tan corduroy blazer to wear to a community college lecture on young last years. He sat in a sea of tan and navy sports jackets, wondering what his favorite psychoanalyst would say about so many people trying so desperately not to stand out. That's a great question. Hey, uh, Dan said, forcing a smile as he sat up straighter. He remembered something Abby had said yesterday. So you took a bus here? Dan had flown from Pittsburgh and then taken a taxi from the tiny airport that looked like it had just run, just won a runway. A couple buses actually. Cops couldn't take the time off, but it's no trouble. Bus, train, subway. It's all second nature when you're from New York. And that's where Jordan's from too? No, Jordan was coming from Virginia. We shared the last leg of the trip. That's an awfully long ride. Why didn't he fly? Oh, his parents got him plane tickets all right, Dan said. But they were to California, not New Hampshire. What? Dan raised his eyebrows. Apparently they think he's at um, Pray the Gay Away camp or something right now. His uncle is paying for this program, and he used the cash from his part-time job to buy the bus ticket. I feel so bad now. Andrew drained the remaining coffee and finished off the last of the oatmeal. But what if his parents find out? What happens then? Abby frowned. Beats me. World War III? No wonder Jordan was so afraid of getting kicked out. Dan felt grateful for his open-minded and easygoing parents, strict as they could be sometimes. He always felt like he'd lucked out with Paul and Sandy, even before they'd officially adopted him. Lots of kids weren't so fortunate. It's nice he has you, uh, you here talk about it, he said. Abby was so easy to be with. It was no surprise that Jordan confided in her. We just get each other. We connected. Abby gathered the things. The buzz of voices in the cafeteria died down as the students ambled outside. All of them headed to the registration. It was a long bus ride. How much could you do to play hangman and chat? I'm sure he would have opened up to you two. Maybe, Dan said, although he highly doubted it. Anyway, he better not miss registration or he'll be forced to open up to Felix in against bioethics. Uh oh. Be nice. Uh, Abby, said Abby, but she was smiling. They filed out behind the other students, grabbing their backpacks from the cubbies, placed up just outside the cafeteria entrance. Apparently, you weren't allowed to bring your bags inside because college kids had a habit of making off with a whole week's worth of croissants and fruit cups. Huh. That makes perfect sense. Seriously, though, Dan said. Dan's it? I've already said that. This morning, Felix asked if I wanted to swap schedules for a buddy system or something. Then, when I finally gave in and showed him the classes I wanted, I could tell he was embarrassed for me. Not enough hard science, I guess. Abby laughed. Yeah, thanks. Laugh at my misery. Dan sneezed when they stepped outside. Bless you. Thanks. Hey, actually, uh, I was actually thinking, though, what if we took a class together or something? You, me, and Jordan, I mean. I know you're here for art, but maybe I could co convince you to take a history class. Hmm, excuse me. He asked. The dormitory spread out on either side of them, forming an almost perfect ring around the grassy quad. Chairs littered the shade under the biggest tree in the quad, and while the benches lining the path were empty now, he imagined they would uh, all be filled later. He'd overheard a few kids in the cafeteria talking about having uh, a lawn bowling tournament after registration. 
Sure, why not? Meanwhile, I've got to make sure I grab a spot in Life Drive. You want me to sign you up? Me? Oh, that's right. You've never seen me claw. That's worse than stick figures. Is there something worse? Whatever it is, that's my skill level. Man shook his head, imagining the look on the instructor's face when he turned at his scribbles. Uh, what? What? There'll be naked girls? Abby said, drawing out the last word teasingly. And naked guys, he replied. Good point. Oh, maybe Jordan will sign up with me. No, thank you. They passed through the quad and the path divided into two, one leading into the admin building where they were going to register for classes, and the other to the support center. Up ahead, Dan spied Felix coming from the gym, pale and upright, uh, walking to reg registration on his own. Dan thought about calling out to him, and really felt that he should. But to be per perfectly honest, he was having a good time just being alone with Abby. Hey losers, wait up! So much for being alone. Jordan ran up the path, sleek looking leather satchel slung diagonally across his chest. A keychain with a pointed-sided die hung from the satchel zipper. Jordan looked uh, like he had just rolled out of bed and thrown on whatever he, uh, was at hand. It somehow he made Dan feel like the sloppy one. Yeah. Where were you? Abby asked, slipping her arm to Jordan's. I don't have that level of comfort with anybody. Anybody. Anyway. We missed you at breakfast. I overslept. How was the food? Gross, probably. Jordan walked quickly and they had to trot a bit to keep up. It wasn't bad, actually, Dan answered, although he wasn't sure Jordan really cared about the answer. Jordan was hard to read, though, he thought. One minute he was up, and the next he was acting outside. And then there was the Jordan who was so afraid of getting kicked out of going home. Although Abby's coffee was a diabetic's nightmare. You got that right. Mom. Dan's just grumpy because his roommate sh uh, shamed him over his class choices this morning. Shamed? What the heck? How is it any of his business, Jordan laughed. You lost the roommate lottery, Danny boy. Me? I won it. He is good stuff. He played the cello for me this morning. Jordan waved a tall, disheveled, or waved to a tall, disheveled guy who was setting up a cello on the grass. He's getting together a chamber music group to play outside the lawn. Can you imagine? I mean, can we hurry up and get to college for real, please? I want cello every morning. I want this. He swept his hand out in front of him. It sure beats living under the Taliban's. I'm so ready for it. What? You shouldn't wish away your life, Abby said smugly. You only get it once. Not if you're Buddhist or a ghost. But you're right. Who wants to get old? Not me. I'll be handsome, of course, distinguished, but still. Wrinkles, back pain, no thanks. He tweaked Abby's nose. At least you'll be gorgeous forever. Dan couldn't argue with that. Dan, on the other hand, already looks middle-aged. I agree. Jordan continued chuckling again. In a good way. Don't hit me. In a good way. What? Look at you over there, all quiet and earnest and Stuff wise beyond your years, man. Like, uh, what? Hot, skinny Buddha? I don't know. Uh, thanks. Dan looked at his feet, his face growing warm. He didn't, uh, didn't particularly want anybody, especially Abby, thinking of Buddha when they looked at him. Is he blushing? I think he's blushing. Jordan crackled and sped up, hugging Abby uh, swiftly along the sidewalk, forcing Dan to hurry and keep pace. Leave him alone, Jordan. She turned to Dan with uh, an apologetic smile. Don't worry, you don't look middle-aged to me. He's just trying to rile you up. From the state of his face, I'd say it's working, Jordan said. You're awfully chipper this morning, Abby said. No bad dreams after last night? Jordan shook his curly head. No, me? No, I slept the sleep of the innocent. It's probably from being away from home. Huh. Hey. Dan thought of his own night and the sleep he definitely hadn't gotten. He seemed to be the only one whom the basement had really affected. He was the only one who had dug deeper into the 
this happens history. He didn't want Abby to join because I think he'd gone all obsessive. And he was glad he hadn't said anything to Abby. It was time to change the subject before he said something he'd regret later. So, Jordan, Abby and I were just talking about what classes we want to take. Okay. Well, we were just thinking uh, some we might take together. Are you interested? Sure, Jordan said, although he took out his phone and began texting at light speed with only his thumb. I can't do that. Dad didn't give it a second thought. Who texted Jordan, or who Jordan texted was his own business. What? Oh, I, I missed the spot. Turning away slightly to shield the screen from them. Dad didn't give it a second thought. Who Jordan texted was his own business. There we go. Talk of courses carried them the remaining distance to the registration. Dan's mood lifted with every step. Abby and he agreed on two classes together, but while Abby and Jordan were taking life drawing, Dan would be in history of psychiatry. He probably knew a lot of the subject matter already, but he knew classes at NHCP were designed to put you in the smartest kids. Posted on a wooden pillar off to the side of the admin building were flyers for a heart concert uh, and L. ARP demonstration. I almost said AARP. And a casual bocce ball match? I don't know. The morning mist had yet to burn off, and the students milling around looked almost like ghosts in a dream. A good dream. Can you imagine doing this every day? Dan said. Taking classes? No, oh, it's exhausting. Abby stepped her course catalog back into the cap messenger bag. No, I mean this. Walking around campus on a nice day with kids who actually want to be here. Going to classes you actually want to take. Amen, said Jordan. Amen, too, said Abby. And she linked arms with Jordan and Dan. I am uncomfortable. Dan was content with himself for once. I was going to say confident. He had two new friends and classes he was actually excited to attend. One day in, the summer was looking up, and it's all downhill from here. After registration, the students were split into a few smaller, more manageable groups and funneled into rooms off the main floor of Wilford Commons. The director of the program was there to help guide the flow of traffic, waving and joking with a few of the professors who idled out in the hall. Inside their designated room, the friends were greeted by a professor and a red-headed guy who was handing out information on the various services available to them, emergency numbers, and maps of the campus. The guy seemed to recognize Jordan, greeting him with a friendly, what's up, before moving on to the next kid in his line. Ugh. Haven't we heard all this a thousand times already? Jordan grousked as they looked, uh, or as they took their seats. A dozen or so rows of chairs had been set up in the front of a pulled down screen. They sat at the end of the third row, backpacks tucked under their feet. I mean, I know I read this somewhere already, the pamphlets, the website. Some of the kids, or some of these kids have never been away from home before, Dan replied. Abby sat between him and Jordan, producing a neon green handout. Have you? Abby asked. It was a friendly, conversational question, but Dan froze. Not sure how to answer. He didn't like to talk about the foster homes he'd been in before lucking out with Paul and Sandy. He was glad when the professor motioned for everyone to be quiet, waiting by the projector until the students had stopped talking. That's Joe, Jordan said, having for the slightly red-headed student. He's a hall monitor on my floor. Kind of cute. A hall monitor? A hall monitor? No way, Abs. That's forbidden fruit. <laughs> Get it? Fruit. What? How stupid. Unfortunately, yes, Abby muttered, rolling her eyes. Uh, I cracked me off, Jordan added, wiping away a non-existent tear. That makes one of us. The dark-haired girl sitting ahead of them turned and glared, silencing Abby and Jordan with a look. Behind her back, Jordan had stuck out his tongue as the professor finally started talking. This is Joe McCullen, and I'm Professor Reyes. Professor Reyes is like a I know you're all probably very bored with orientation stuff, but this will be quick and painless, I promise. What? Mm -hmm. Her name sounded familiar. Dan reached quietly into his pocket and pulled out his hidden one. Scanning the list, he found that she was his history of uh, psychiatry professor. He tucked the schedule away again, fixing his attention to the front of the room. Uh, she was shorter to Joe by at least a head, and looked approachable enough, with ready cheeks and a gap in her teeth. She wore all black 
you seem to wear a funky necklace of purple stones. First, a few words of um, dorm safety. I'm getting a Harry Potter vibe all of a sudden. Can't let his eyes wander around the room. A few seats down, he saw Felix sitting bolt upright in his chair. He sighed, thinking he'd really have to include his roommate more, and maybe see if an hour or two kicking back as a group would bring Felix out of his shell. But he genuinely liked that he, uh, what he had going with Abby and Jordan, and if Felix made things weird, Dan would be blamed for them, for forcing him into the dynamic. I apologize. Brooklyn has had a rich, complex past, Professor Reyes was saying. So if you have any questions, ask any time. History is nothing to be afraid of. Okay. I think that's going to be it for today. If I read another chapter, we'll be here for about another 20 minutes. What do you guys think? I'm intrigued, if nothing else. Uh, did any of you get to see the episode that I suggested to you? It's on Netflix, I think. I think. I'm going to check again. I really feel like that's where this is going. But it might do something differently. I'm not too sure. Anywho, I'm going to eat my baked potato, upload these, and watch some videos. Let me know what you guys think. It really feels like it's going to be paranormal, not so much supernatural. Again, let me know where you stand on which means what and how you define one or the other. Um, and if you have any suggestions for more movies for me to watch this month of October, let me know down in the comments. Um, last year, the I had to watch two a day, and the criteria was it had to be the remake and then the original. So, if, if that's the case, like you know, what what would be a good one for this month? I could watch sequels without watching the originals, because there are a bunch of them I haven't seen. Um, I haven't seen the uh, remake of Halloween, the first one. I might watch that one. Or maybe I'll watch the second one. I don't know. We'll see what happens. And anyway, until next time, goodbye everybody. Let's see, what's today? 30 days have to come through. Okay, so the next time we see each other, it will be in October. Happy Halloween.